Durud and welcome to our latest edition of the Iranian Studies Initiative Lectures in collaboration with the University of California, Santa Barbara. I am Ali Reza Ardekani, the Executive Director of Farhang Foundation, a non-political, non-religious, and not-for-profit organization that thrives with the support of its members. Our sole mission is to celebrate and promote Iranian art and culture enriching the global community at large. Today, we are honored to welcome award-winning author Ava Homa to the season premiere of our UC Santa Barbara talk series. This series is made possible with the support of the American Institute of Iranian Studies, the Persian Heritage Foundation, the California Humanities, and the Garamian Imrani Foundation. Please note that we will be holding a Q&A session at the end of today's program. So please do submit your questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Now it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Janet Afari, the Director of the Iranian Studies Initiative at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Thank you very much and hello everyone. I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our speaker today, Homa Ava, an award-winning novelist and activist who teaches creative writing at the California State University in Monterey Bay. Her debut novel, Daughters of Smoke and Fire, published by HarperCollins and Abrams in 2020, was listed as one of the best books of the year in outlets such as the Wall Street Journal, The Independent of London, and the Globe and Mail of Toronto, Canada. Daughters of Smoke and Fire weaves 50 years of modern Kurdish history, Iranian history, and gender history in a riveting tale. The book covers the resistance of Kurds in Iran, Iraq, Turkey, and Syria against multiple brutal authoritarian regimes, including the government of the Islamic Republic of Iran. It also provides a behind the scene look at the young Kurdish women who heroically engaged in the battles against ISIS. But while covering these grand epics of struggle and of resistance, the book also pays keen attention to intimate gender relations at home, the treatment of girls in families, the privileges enjoyed by men, and the many ways in which talented and promising young women are told from a very young age to lower their sights and put their lives at the service of their fathers, brothers, husbands, and sons, no matter how misguided. This lecture and others in the series will be live streamed and available via social media, such as YouTube and Facebook. I hope you join us for the remainder of the series, which will continue through May of 2024. Welcome. Hi, Janet. Thank you very much for that warm introduction. Um, I'm very happy to be speaking with all of you here today. Um, thanks to Ali Reza and Dr. Janet for giving me this platform to connect with you. Thank you for making time for being here today. And also thank you, uh, thanks to those of you who will be listening to us later. Um, let me share my slideshow. So today I am going to talk about the interconnection between basically art and activism as nowadays is commonly known as artivism and specifically looking at literary arts as a form of uh, engaging with the world. And today I will share a little bit of my journey, how I came to become author of two books of fiction. I will specifically talk about the story behind Daughters of Smoke and Fire. Um, I'll go a little bit into the role of literature as time's witness, uh, which could be an important, but also a little bit of a tricky role for literature to play. Um, I'll look a little bit deeper into the very concept of bearing witness, what that means and why we're using the word bearing when we're talking about witnessing. Um, and then I'll end the session with a reading uh, of the novel. Um, so this is the cover of my first book, Echoes from the Other Land, which was published in 2010 in Toronto by Mawanzi House. 
It's a collection of short stories of nine Iranian women in different cities across Iran. And this one specifically looks at the gender battles that Iranian women have proudly fought for over a century. Um, oppression is not unique to Iran or to the region in general, but what is unique about the Iranian women is, um, as well as Kurdish women, is both sister groups have continuously and for over a century have fought for gender equality. Um, one of the quotes that caught my attention as a student looking at, you know, American literature and English literature was this quote by famous American author, Joy Carol Oates, when he, she talks about that one of the little understood responsibilities of the artist is to bear witness in almost a religious sense to certain things, she says. The experience of suffering, for example, the humiliation of any form of persecution. Um, and that's a very delicate balance to keep in terms of what is the role of artists and how to incorporate bearing witness in an artistic way. Uh, when I was a young girl born and raised in the Kurdistan of Iran and in, in a very heavily oppressed and impoverished part of the world, um, it was hard for me to make sense of the world around me and my role in it. Um, and so I basically turned to books and stories and literature as a way to understand um, people around me as well as to get a glimpse into who I am. And I, in that sense, his story, stories have historically been a very powerful um, tool into getting us to understand ourselves better and other people better. It's a, it's a tricky thing to do. A lot of us, um, like to think that we know what other people exactly think or feel, but that's not entirely true. And so stories and novels and literature play a unique unique way in that way, giving us that access. And then there was the barriers of traveling again as a woman in Iran where you can't book a hotel as a single woman. You can't easily travel with all the restrictions there books um, became this this vessel for me to explore a lot of territories. Um, and so in that way, uh, it really reminds me of Emily Dickinson's poem about books being a, a ship, a frigate, she calls it. And it's a cheap one that anyone can afford in that sense. It's very uh, democratic in its accessibility to people of different um, social classes. And as I read more and as I uh, connected more with different stories, I started thinking about writing as a form of empowerment. Uh, Margaret Atwood, the well-respected Canadian author, talks uh, has this famous quote that I love, and it's a bookmark that I use. And she says, a word after a word after a word is power. But why is that? How is that? How can writing empower someone who is destined to be among one of the most powerless people in the world? In where I grew up, Ibn Khaldun's saying that um, um, geography is destiny was something that resonated with so many of us. And so many of us wondered if we really could have a destiny apart from the geography and the location where we were living. So there was there was this idea of like my relationship with my stories and my journals as a very private relationship. It wasn't something that I was willing to share with the world until I got into graduate school in Tehran and I was a student in Alame where we dived deeper, deeper as uh, students of English literature into um, literature from across the world, but really mostly literature that was written in English. And that's when I uh, felt compelled to take some writing workshops and start sharing what was private and sacred previously. Um, at the time, I would go to basically any writing workshop that was offered anywhere across Tehran, but I was really lucky in terms of finding um, Siamak Golshiri, who is the son of uh, Ahmad Golshiri, the translator, and is the um, nephew of Hushangi Golshiri, the most prominent, one of the most prominent story writers of Iran. And as I followed him from one uh, short story workshop to another, to another, 
um, I had the opportunity to learn so much about the craft of writing, the, the techniques of storytelling and all of that from him. Um, and even though he wasn't very impressed by me in the beginning of the workshops, near the end, he was one of the first people who ever encouraged me to continue writing. He told me that he runs a lot of workshops and he reads a lot of people's stories and people either are very talented in writing or they're very determined to continue doing it. And in his words, I was one of the people that had both the passion and determination. Um, so he was very certain that I would be successful as an author. I was not. I was full of self-doubt. It did help when I gained admission from a university in Windsor to study creative writing, um, master's degree in creative writing, and they offered me a scholarship. Um, at the time, I was teaching at Qashm Azad University as a full-time faculty member, and it was a very um, high position that I had secured after years of you know, working hard to where that I already had a master's degree from Alame, but I did make this decision of going and pursuing creative writing, um, mostly because they offered me scholarship and other universities that offered me a PhD, an entrance into admission into PhD program didn't give me any financial aid. So I ended up just taking what was available to me. And I know as I started writing in Canada and my first book was published, I first, like maybe like a lot of newcomers, I had this moment of this experience of feeling like it was a honeymoon stage, that everything was glittery and peaceful and democratic in this new land. And I don't deny how good uh, Canada was to me and what a beautiful country it is. But I was very naive in my perspective of thinking, OK, I'm not censored here. There is no censorship going on here. And so I can just write freely and talk about gender role and ethnic role and all of those things. But it came this epiphany shortly after my book came out when I understood the difference between being silenced versus being heard. That in this new place that I call home, no one held a gun to my head or threatened to take me to prison or refused to publish my works because I was talking about equality. But on the other hand, there was this clear hierarchy of voices that I need to understand. And once again, I found myself at the very bottom of that hierarchy. So there was a sense of disillusionment when I realized even though I did earn some income out of writing and speaking engagements that came with it, it was not something that I could sustain myself on. I was living alone. Uh, like I said, I left on a student visa without any support, any family support, without knowing anyone. And so it felt like writing, which had been my passion for forever, was something that could definitely not sustain me. Plus, I was writing in my third language. So there was a lot of um, obstacles in front of me that had me question the value of my work because writing takes a lot of dedication and I wasn't sure if I want to continue. I mean, I was always sure that I would never stop writing, but I wasn't sure how much of my life would be centered around writing. And then there was this um, really life-changing moment where I was giving a reading of Echoes from the Other Land. And in this book, it's entirely centered on gender role. And only two of the stories are set in Kurdistan, where this construction worker who was initially from uh, Iraqi Kurdistan, living in Toronto, came and bought one of my books and wanted me to sign a book for him. And I looked at his hands and I could see this really rough um, construction hands. They were the hands of a person uh, who has been exposed to harsh weather, hands of a person who worked really hard for every dollar that they made. And um, I wasn't even sure he would be comfortable reading in English, but he bought the book. And at that moment, I just wanted, I tried to offer him the book. I was like, no, 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 you don't, you don't have to pay for this. It's okay. But he just looked at me and there was a tear in his eyes and he just wiped the tear and said, no, I want to support you. Please write our stories. Um, and, and he left and I don't really know where he is and never ran into him. But that moment has stayed with me that someone uh, that wasn't even from the country that I had grown up in, that I talked to about a book that wasn't directly written about him. He just wiped the tear and said, please continue writing my stories, writing our stories. And as I was dealing with as a person who had been in Canada for only two years, just got my master's degree in English, realized that finding a job with a master's degree in English 
it's close to impossible even for people who were born speaking English, let alone a newcomer like me. When I came across, it was in 2010 at the time uh, when a lot of people came across um, Farzad's letters written from prison. Now, Farzad Kamangar is not the first or the last political prisoner or Kurdish political prisoner who has been mistreated and tortured and imprisoned in Iran. But something about Farza really resonated with a lot of people. And his writing was something that in so many ways um, bridged the ethnic gap that exists in Iran between different ethnicities. And that was very important to me. I wanted to know who this person is. Obviously in, in history, we read a lot about larger than life characters like Gandhi, like Nelson Mandela, who are able to turn hatred and division into love, who, who are able to lead movements, but they were not Kurdish and they were not my age. Here was this Farzad Kamangar, only a couple of years older than me, a simple village teacher writing not just about himself, but also about his students who are really deprived of the most basic things that the rest of the world is pretty much have access to. And and then they, they executed him exactly on Mother's Day in May 2010. And there was a lot of um, petitions taken, actions taken, hoping to save his life, but unfortunately it didn't work. Um, and as I tried to dig deeper into who this man was and why did he touch so many Iranians, regardless of their ethnic background, I realized that Farzad was different from so many others in so many ways, so much better than me because he had a rich inner life. Farzad kept saying that I won't let them kill me inside. And this was despite the tortures and the mistreatments that he was receiving, that he continued to talk about humanity, hope and love. And I wanted to see how you can be in one of the most notorious prisons in the world in Evan and be tortured for your Kurdish accent and be tortured for um, Kurdish ringtone on your phone. And that's on top of everything that all the political prisoners receive and still maintain hope, right? Because it's so easy to fall into self-pity and disappointment. And how could this young, simple person hold on to his hope and his love for his people? One of the things that I have um, always posted on my, um, uh, on my desk and constantly go back to when things become hard is this quote by Toni Morrison, one of my favorite authors, who emphasizes that there is really, in fact, in the time of hardship, there is no time for despair, no place for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. She says, we speak, we write, we do language. This is how civilizations heal. And that really became my mantra and it still is in the harshest time that we don't really have time to lose hope. We don't really have time to fall into the trap of fear and self-pity. We speak, we write, we do language. This is how civilizations heal. Um, and so I started digging deeper into the role of witness literature, what it is and in what way literature has been able historically and can potentially change things in the world. So what now, what is witness literature? It is often defined as a kind of writing that feels like a blend of reporting and lyrical prose or just literary prose in, in some way. And it's like bringing a poetic attention to headlines that are often very shallow, uh, tragic, but really shallow in their treatment of tragedy. Um, witness literature is the kind of writing that can provide healing to the writer as well as to the readers who can see themselves in this or resonate with this or feel like they're not alone in the world, right? As James. And so in terms of what it does in, att in attention to bringing uh, poetic attention to headlines is it it's very powerful in calling out our ignorances. Um, it's very powerful in combating numbness or apathy or indifference. Uh, that media generates in us by constantly exposing us to too much horror. In so many ways, Whitland's literature is the antidote to that. 
And in some specific ways, not always, it can result in specific actions like signing petition, writing to representatives. Um, I was very skeptical of this when I first started writing, but in reality, so many people have emailed me that they have contacted their uh, representatives. And this is what Joe Biden said about this is why and how we can support Iranian women. And this is what, you know, my representative, my Congress member said. So it's not as common, but it's, it has happened. And I have witnessed this, that sometimes readers take specific actions to deal with the knowledge that they have gained. Going to the concept of bearing witness and why the word bearing is used, Natalie Diaz is another one of my favorite poets. She published post-colonial poetries and was either nominated or won the National Book Award for it. She's an indigenous author, a very, very talented author, and one of the great examples of uh, writing witness poetry and bringing, um, connecting us to the indigenous experience in ways that an essay may not be able to do it or a journalistic piece may not exactly be able to do it. But she talks about the fact that some people don't actually bear it at all and they just look and they look and just look away and go to sleep that it doesn't in any way move or shape them to take action. And this is a reality. There is no denying that for some people, bearing witness is either something that they don't know how to do because nobody really teaches you or just something that they don't have built the capacity for it um, is what I try to think as opposed to no, no one has desires to bear witness. I feel like most of us do have this desire to heal ourselves and each other. We just don't know because we are not trained for it. So to bear is to bear witness, not just to look, to actually bear that and to speak the truth to power, which this makes me back to the idea of then how do I bear truth? How do I bear witness without harming myself? Is there a healthy way to bear witness that's more healing than harmful? Um, going back into the fact that in what ways has words actually changed our world, I came across a lot of really good examples, like when how books like Gone with the Wind or Uncle Tom's Cabin were able to shift the public's perspective about slavery from, you know, happy servants to victims of history and even to defiant heroes. Um, in Europe, the book called The Citadel was one of the first books that talks about ethics and morality in medicine. And it actually laid a foundation for, for this organization that later came to be called National Health Service. So there is no denying that words have been able to create a shift in our world, but only for people who are willing to open their hearts and bring this shift into their lives. Um, which gets, brings me back to, well, then how can we present without absorbing pain? And this is something that I didn't know when I first started writing Daughters of Smoke and Fire. The cover you see here is a Canadian cover, um, which is different from the red cover that's uh, available in the United States and the UK. Um, so as I was, I did put myself through a lot of difficult times as I researched atrocities and tried to digest them and absorb them and, um, present them in an artistic manner that's understandable and digestible for my readers. But I really didn't know how to not harm myself or cause unnecessary suffering for myself. That's what I mean by harm, uh, causing unnecessary suffering because in no way bearing witness is meant to cause unnecessary suffering for the reader or for the writer in any way. And so one of my friends, Susan Darvish, gave me this, just one day handed me this book out of the blue called The Book of Joy. And she said, oh, I see a lot of strength in you. I just don't see enough joy in your life. And it was true. Um, I didn't know how to bring joy into the kind of work that I had started doing and the kind of responsibility I had taken on as an artist. Um, and in that, Desmond Tutu and Dalai Lama have a conversation when we talk about joy, about different from different religious perspectives, spiritual perspective. And they talk about the capacity in all of us to create a shift of perspective from being completely self-focused to being able to see others and basically not just helping others, really helping ourselves and expanding ourselves and building a capacity within ourselves by doing that. And then they talk about going from anguish to compassion, which is a very um, subtle, but really powerful shift that we can focus on and create on our lives. 
Um, well, as I started looking into other literature that, you know, Jewish literature, Black literature, Indigenous literature, um, the concept of suffering um, changed. And as the concept changed, its power over me also changed. It was no longer a question of my own unworthiness or my community's unworthiness for suffering. In, instead, suffering became a universal aspect of humanity. It's just a condition, you know, like any other human condition, like living in bodies that are inevitably going to decay and get ill and die. There is no way out of it. The same thing with suffering. It's a human condition. doesn't mean that all groups and all genders um, suffer the same amounts, but it's important to know that, like I said, like James Baldwin kept saying, that we're not alone in our suffering and our pain is not a sign of unworthiness. It doesn't mean something's wrong with us or we've done something awful to deserve this. And Ross Gay, another one of my uh, favorite American poets, um, has an essay called um, Joy is the Human Madness. And it's published on On Being, which is a really powerful uh, podcast by Krista Tepet. And in it, he says, is sorrow the true wild? And if it is, and if we join them, your wild to mine, what is that? So he talks about connecting our suffering with each other. For joining too is a kind of annihilation. What if we joined our sorrows? I'm saying, I'm saying, what if that is joy? And really, is it possible to connect our sufferings and create joy from that? Um, I am under no illusion that my book um, can change the world. I have no delusion of grandeur, but I wanted to share some moments with you when people, after the book came out, people from across the world reached out to me and shared their interpretation with the book with me. Now, if you look up Daughters of Smoke and Fire reviews, you will see what critics have said about the book. And I don't in any way mean to say it's not important, obviously. It's very important for me to be respected in the literary community but it's also really important to me to see if I achieve what I set out to do, which was what Farza did in terms of bringing us together, in terms of basically touching that part that's common between all of us, despite all of our other differences. So it's not a denial of difference. It's about um, the, the ability to connect despite that. And so... The pictures that really meant a lot to me and I'm sharing here are the pictures of these um, refugees who are holding my book. This is what happened. One of my author friends, Julie, uh, went to visit her daughter and her daughter volunteers at a refugee camp um, in Greece. And she took the book with her and she found um, a group of Iranian refugees and a group of Kurdish refugees and handed the, bo the book. And then she sent me these pictures and it really meant so much because I wasn't majoring in English, but couldn't really see my own image reflected back to me. Um, no one has written Kurdish women into literature. It is our job to write ourselves into literature. And I hope that younger generation, as they grow up, they're able to see a picture of themselves, a representation in literature. And this beautiful calligraphy, um, is something an Iranian gentleman sent to me, whom I don't really know personally, but I'm very grateful to for sending this beautiful artwork to me. Um, here's another uh, beautiful picture that I got from a book club. Um, a couple of Iranian women reached out to me and uh, wrote to me that they had tears in their eyes when they read Daughters of Smoke and Fire because even though they grew up in Iran like me, they really weren't aware of the realities and depths of what it's like to be Kurdish. And I don't blame them because there aren't actual representations. You can't expect political parties to represent people. And obviously the Iranian government does not allow for any authentic representation. So it's really true literature that we can make up for what's missing. And then I got more and more books from other people. Here's a group of American women holding a book club and sending me their picture. The two drawings here were done by an artist in Europe, a young artist who tried to imagine my characters, Leila and her brother, Chia, 
Um, she sent other pictures, but these are the two I brought to share. This one is a beautiful handicraft that a Canadian woman did and mailed it to me, actually, uh, based on the Canadian cover. And here's another um, reader, again, reading the book and trying to put it into painting and into drawing. And so that that really means the world to me to know people have taken the time to do these things and have taken the time to reach out to me. And, and honestly, that's more important to me even than what the critics have, have said, despite my gratitude for what they have said. And so at the end, um, I just wanted to repeat a quote by another one of my favorite authors. Obviously, I have a lot. I love books. Is uh, Abraham Verghese, who wrote Covenant of Water talks about how fiction is the great lie that reveals the deepest truth. And it's true, there is no character called, no real person called Leila Salman out there whose story I wrote in addition to Chia's story. But in so many ways, uh, Gina Massa Amini's uh, tragic end devastated so many of us. And even though Leila's story is very different and unique and Gina Massa Amini's story was unique in its own way, a book like Daughters of Smoke and Fire can give access to what it's actually like to be a young Kurdish woman who deals with gender oppression on one hand, but really on ethnic oppression on the other hand as well. And uh, at this point, if there is time, I just wanted to read a couple, a couple pages of the book. This is chapter 26, but this is really the first thing I wrote because I wrote it uh, inspired by Farzad's story. And um, in the middle of the reading it, I will play a little bit of Shah Al Nazari's lullaby, just because I imagined Chia, my fictional character, who's inspired by Farzad, as finding a way to connect with other people. And I thought he would be singing to them. Um, and I thought a lullaby is a very ironic way of um, trying to get people to wake up to reality. The call to prayer that reverberates through Evan prison turns me cold with fear, footsteps. I know the sound of those heavy boots, I know them well. I hear the iron doors open and shut, hear the jingle of the guard's huge keychain, then another metal door opens and shut, and yet another. The footsteps grow louder. I drop my pen and curl into a ball shrinking with fear. Three more doors and then they'll reach mine. The pain in my head and face, legs and back, stomach and ribs sharpen. Clutching at the pillow does not stop my arms from shaking. The footsteps stop before they reach my word. Hands up, I think, and almost say it out loud. Hands up, the old guard says. I know what they're doing in the other cell, a blindfold, a click of the handcuffs and the guards take Ali out, pushing and kicking him. I follow them in my head as Ali is taken downstairs and dragged 19 steps to the right, down 15 more stairs and delivered to the interrogators. Under his blindfold, Ali will count the shoes in the room, four, six, eight, black formal shoes splattered with blood, polished by blood. The whipping will start soon after the curses. If the man they call Mongrel is there, the interrogation would last longer. Every prisoner knows that this man's strange voice and unusual soft timber that can detonate in an instant. He calls Kurds treacherous, murdering savages, then shows us who the true savage is. Five, six, six lashes in and Ali will start thinking about concentration camps, pyramids, the Great Wall of China. He will not feel the whipping anymore, I hope. The number of cracks on the wall, number 305 today. I sneak a pen out from under my army blanket and take paper folded six times from my underwear. Layla. I write, but my pen is paralyzed. Guilt gnaws at me for having abandoned her. My dear students, I write, and my pen gallops.
All I was able to teach you was our alphabet, our literature, and our history. Please, children, pass it on. Dear little ones, never allow this knowledge to steal from you the joy of childhood. May you keep the memories of youth in your minds forever. It may be the one and only investment you can later use when the agony of earning bread and butter dominates you, my sons, and the sins of being the second sex overpowers you, my daughters. Men in prison, uh, men in prison blue smock drug their white flip-flops on the ground, the stairs creak. Remember, I write, not to turn your backs on your dream, on your loves, on your poetry, and Kurdistan's magical nature. Get together and recite folk songs like we used to. Lamp in a metal grating spreads dull light. The still toilet in my solitary cell stings. In me, there was a rough prisoner, not used to the clanking of his chains. I recite a log, clinging to the doors of my cell, a space that's only five paces wide, wall to wall. Through the bars, Ali looks so dried up, so weak, but his voice is firm. Shamlu's poems again. I have not seen myself in prison for months. Mirrors don't exist in prison, but I'm sure I don't look much better than Ali. What could be more healing, I say. Not your own poetry then, I wondered. I'm not a poet, only a teacher who loves poetry. I try to turn my head towards him, the head that's stuck between iron rods. Did I tell you I had a student with the name Ali? Ali mirrors me and winces. I know that under the prison gown, his body is a web of scars from all the wounds he has sustained. Mine is too. What would you do to them, Chia? Ali's voice is shaking. His cheeks and eyes are bruised and his muscles still. What would you do if you could do anything you wanted to these sadists? I think about this question for a long time. I'd send them to rehab. Ali forces a laugh. Does your foot still hurt? My entire body does, Ali Gyan, but this is the pain of a nation and the cure too. So it's not all that bad. Make sure you don't forget us, Mamusta, when you're freed. He calls me Mamusta, teacher, his voice growing fainter. Even though his body is stronger than mine, I know he is too frail to stand or speak much longer. I spent 18 days in an emergency room after my open sores from the interrogation sessions became infected. I was barely allowed to sleep, not allowed to use the washroom more than twice in 24 hours and was kept in a cold lockdown. All I had to wrap around me was a once white man. Lie, 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 I start singing. Ali weeps and I sing louder. My lullaby passes through the concrete walls. Other prisoners, political or non-political are quiet. My lullaby soothes them, even though they don't speak my language. Some of them sob like infants. 18, 19, 20. I count the cracks in the ceiling. My lawyer is presenting documents to the judge. Here, it is hard to breathe. The room reeks as if the walls were made of corpses. The judge leaves his seat and walks to the door that convicts cannot use. It's only for him. The attached light brown desk divide his honor space from that of the non-honored ones. Chia is absolutely innocent, your honor, my lawyer says for the third time. He's not a part of any political group, your honor. Nothing in his judicial files and records demonstrate any link to the charges of terrorism brought against him. There are only three of us in this room. Five minutes have passed, but the judge seems not to be listening. I wait for him to speak. He tucks some papers under his arm and walks to the door only he's allowed to use. I'm going for my afternoon prayer. Your afternoon prayer? I shout, I can't help myself. He stops. I've been in prison for 545 days. The words jump out of me. For 112 of those days, those days, I was not allowed to contact my family, seek legal counsel, or even know what my crime was supposed to be. The judge touches his gray beard. I imagine he houses dead mice there. Every step he takes toward the door makes me speak louder. My arms and legs tremble with pain as I lurch towards him, courtesy of the jolts of electric electricity. 
I was proven innocent of all the charges brought against me. They didn't even bother to make up a single document against me. The judge does not pay attention to me. Worms wriggling in his ears must stop my words from getting true. Absolutely zero evidence has been presented against someone, Your Honor. Zero, the lawyer says. The judge holds the door handle. He looks back, glances around the empty room, and sees search on the camera installed over his high chair. It's a lot ordered your death, he whispers. There's nothing I can do. And he turns his back, leaving the room abruptly through his private door. My lawyer gapes, I scream, and the screams bounce off the wall and back to me. A security guard runs and presses my wrist against my back. I wasn't speaking with my hands. I say softly, hush, brother, hush. The young sunburned guard whispers with a heavy accent. The lawyer shakes his head and waves his hand in the air. Only five minutes behind closed, closed door and not even a word of explanation. Hush, Chia, hush, I think. Not because there isn't much to say, but because speaking here is a threat to a national security and enmity against God. The doors shut behind us. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. I'm sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, you can contact me through my website if you guys have any questions. And I think at this point, Dr. Jeanette will help me answer any questions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. I, I really did enjoy reading your book. It was it was uh, sometimes difficult to read and sometimes funny, actually, and sometimes enjoyable. It was just all of those things at the same time. So you had a lot of questions, and I'm just going to start reading all of them, praising your remarkable work. So let's start with what we have here. Um, it says, thank you for your talk. The Kurdish people are such brave people and I've always been fearless against oppression. As a Kurdish woman, how are you inspired by the recent movements in Iran? And what do you see for the future of Iran and the freedom movement? Thank you. I think what happened in last year was a phenomenal moment for me because I have been following Iranian women's movement and Kurdish women's movement that have been going on like parallel sister movement for about a century. And last year through Jina and through the uh, the slogan of Jinjian Azadi, Woman Life Freedom, for the first time I felt like both parts of my identity merged, that for the first time, these sister movements merged and really empowered each other. And I feel like if we continue doing that, if we continue acknowledging each other's strength, if we continue to borrow and learn from each other, we will be able to rise against oppression. Um, that's really my hope. I know it's a very long way to go, but I think that is the true way to our democracy and freedom. It's not something we can gain over not, but it's something we can work towards. Right. And it wasn't just some accident that the two finally came together. There's all this work that women's groups have done, uh, Iranian women, Kurdish women, to actually connect, build these ties. And so when the moment came, the ties actually became concrete. Um, I, f I really felt that way because uh, watching, you know, write, writings of Nargis Muhammadi, Shirin Abadi before that, they've always really try to reach out, at least on this side, I've seen it. It was just really nice to see that finally it came to fruition. Uh, the power of, uh, sorry, the power of feminist movement is the idea of intersectionality. And the more we embrace that intersectionality, the more powerful we get. It's just, it's difficult in practice, mm -hmm. right? Because sometimes instead of communication, there is like, defense and attack movement. And so that's very disheartening for, for all of us. But yeah, intersectionality is, is everything. Right, your book is really a great example of intersectionality. Thank you. It's about the Kurdish issue, it's about gender issue, it's about Iranian politics, about working class issues. You bring all those really very well in your work. Um, another question, you mentioned that you're writing in your third language. How different your writing would have been if it were writing the same in Kurdish or Persian? 
That's actually a beautiful thing to ask because I think often about the power of language and it's not just we're using words differently. You, the entire philosophy and perspective changes from one language to another. And therefore, I am 100% sure and I've done this, I practice this. So when I have the same story in my mind and I write it in Farsi, it comes out differently from Kurdish, it comes out completely differently from English. And uh, there is so much power and beauty in the ability to maneuver between these cultures. And like I said, it's not just about the language, it's this worldviews, this philosophies, this set of values that come sometimes can even be conflicted, right? But being able to maneuver between them, to read in this three, to write in this three. But to master English language took me a lot of determination because I didn't grow up with this language. Um, and so I had to work really hard to be able to create literary work in my third language. Right. This one is not a question, just a comment. Congratulations on your representation of Kurdish women. It is so important to have correct representation for the Western world to learn more about the Kurdish minority, especially the women. Thank you. Um, this is a question. Congratulations on this incredible book. What are you working on next? Uh, can we anticipate another novel in the near future? Um, thank you. I actually just completed a novel, and um, but it will take, I don't know if the audience is aware of how publishing world works in America. It will take a while for my agent to sign a contract with a publisher, and then the publisher would take a couple more years before they send the book out in the world. Um, but, but my novel is complete, and I'm excited for it. This one touches on um, life of refugees in the United States. Oh, Great. Well, we look forward to that very much. Mm -hmm. um, this question, what is the relationship between Kurdish music and Kurdish literature? Which one is more influenced by the other? Um, that's a deep there question. I, I don't know if I have done historical research into quite understanding how literature and music empower each other. Um, other than what we can, you know, assume. But I would say, like, even the, the Kurdish dance in and of itself is very representative of a group of people that had to fight for the right to live. And so even, like, holding hands and, like, stomping foot and, like, creating a wall and um, is very representative of the resistance. I mean, in, in among Kurds, one of the most common mantras is that Khodan Jiana, resistance is life. And it really is like we are, we don't want to be defined by oppression. We want to be defined by resistance. So while we don't deny the, all the oppression that we're going through that is political, but also translate into, say, economic oppression, it translates into the fact that we're not given good roads, we don't have good high schools, we don't have good cultural center, we don't even have good medical centers, right? So uh, oppression translates itself in so many different ways. And while we experience that firsthand and grow against all the odds, it's important for us to show that we don't let that define us, that we, will, we won't become just just victims. And I think that's something that I see, that idea of resistance is something that is clear in the in the music. I mean, isn't that ironic that Kurdish music is one of the most upbeat music in the world, despite its really difficult history? I mean, that in and of itself is very telling, um, including its, its literature as well, which again, literature, like which in what language did Kurdish writers write in? What kind of literature would you define as Kurdish writer? Is it the ethnicity of the author? Because a lot of Kurdish writers have ended up writing in Turkish and Persian and Arabic. And how would you categorize Kurdish literature in its complexity? But right off the top of my head, and I wish I had done more research into this, I would say the idea of resistance is something that they basically feed off of each other. Wonderful. Um, by the way, have you any thoughts about translating this into other languages, maybe specifically Persian, because it's absolutely something that Persian speakers must read? Well, I would love for it to be translated. Uh, a couple yeah. translators in Iran right. started working no, on it. Right, there are also publishers and translators abroad, of course, who could do that. 
Yes. So if there's anyone who is interested, I would be honored to speak with them and support them. In fact, 70% of the book was translated by a translator in Iran who didn't end up translating it because he was afraid for his life. He said, this is is too risky. But if there's anyone else who would like to pick it up from here, um, I I actually have the right. I got it from the publisher. So I have the Persian rights. The book was translated into Kurdish and was published and sold in Iraqi Kurdistan was a bestseller there, but it's not still available in Persian. But I'm sure as more people become aware of it and are willing to open their hearts to to understand what it's like to be Kurdish in Iran, then the book would become more accessible. Wonderful. Um, Ali Kioni asks, please elaborate on the comment, quote, create dangerously for people who read dangerously. Um, So it's the idea of pulling ourselves out of our comfort zone, right? So there are some stories that are very familiar. And this is um, most of what's available on social media and on like streaming services, right? Stories that don't shake us, don't move us, don't make us think deeply about something. They pure, they're pure escape, right? And they're not necessarily bad. Like when we're exhausted, you know, an escapist form of art, whether it's a book or a movie or music can be a good relief, but it can define our entire life. So the question is, are we willing for our beliefs to be questioned, right? Um, Because we hold them so strongly. Uh, And so are, are we willing to question our own beliefs? Are we willing to present a kind of work that would question other people's beliefs in that way that's what it means to me and i'm sure other readers might have different interpretation of writing dangerously for people who want to there's one last question um uh, by an anonymous have you met any kurdish people who are converting to the zoroastrian religion uh like awad darya who has established an official zoroastrian church in iraqi kurdistan I haven't personally met anyone, but I know since Islam has been forced, a lot of people think it's been forced upon them. There have been a lot of conversions or like completely giving up on religion or changing to to different religion. I don't really have specific um, data on that. I haven't looked into conversion in that sense, Um, but I'm sure people try to look for meaning in so many ways. My own religion is is literature and so it gives me a lot of answers it gives me purpose thanks so much that was just wonderful um would you like to wrap up have anything else to add before we end i just wanted to again thank all of us all of you who came here and were with us today um and i'm gonna again thank farhang especially elirza and university of santa barbara uc santa barbara dr janet afari for this opportunity to connect with everyone we were delighted to have you thank you thank you so much uh, Ms. homa for joining us today and for sharing your powerful book with us uh, for our audience members, please note that you may find a direct link to the book on farhang.org. We also sent it in the chat on this uh, Zoom webinar, so you can access it there if you uh, want to pick up the book. And a special thanks to Dr. Janet Afari and the entire team at UC Santa Barbara for organizing this annual series with Farhang Foundation. As always, please be sure to visit farhang.org for all our latest upcoming events, talks, and programs. We thank you all for joining us from across the globe today for today's talk, and we look forward to welcoming you next time. Until then, we bid you farewell. Thank you, ladies, uh, uh, for joining us today, and uh, we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Mm